Good morning, everyone. It is so great to be with you this morning. I'm Jen Lewis, and I'm on staff here at the Vineyard Church. And I've got to tell you that even though we can't be together physically, I'm so thankful that we can be together virtually through technology. Before we get started with service this morning, I want to make sure that you know that we want to know you're here. You're at an advantage. You know I'm here. You know Chris is here. You can see us, but we can't see you. And so we would love to know that you're here. If you would, please, you can fill out your connection card, which is linked to the video, and you can let us know. Just fill out as much information as you're comfortable with and let us know you're here. I have to be honest, I'm somewhat selfish about the connection card because I'm the one who sees them when they come in on Sunday mornings, and I love to see all the names. I love that if I know you, I can visualize your face in my mind, and I know you're with us. So please take a minute right now and fill out that connection card. Also, now is a perfect time that if you're watching this service on social media, that you can share this service and let others join us as we worship God together. So on that note, let us spend some time in worship through song. You can stand, you can sit, you can be loud, you can be quiet, whatever you feel comfortable with. But let us take this time to focus on God, to focus on the words of the song, and sing to Him a joyful noise. Creation, 
everything with breath repeat the sound all the children clean hands pure hearts good grace good god his name is jesus swing wide all you heavens let the praise go up as the walls come down all creation everything with breath repeat the sound all his children clean hands pure hearts good grace good god his name is jesus sweet wine all you heavens let the praise go up as the walls come down all creation All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good face, good God, his name is Jesus. Well, I don't know about you, but worship for me can be so refreshing and encouraging. And I hope that it was for you this morning as well. If you're new with us, we are so glad you're here. And even though I can't visualize your face, I would love to see your name this week. You can let us know if you're new here that you are joining us today by texting the word NEW, N-E-W, to the number 304-242 0463. You will receive a text back that will allow you to give us any personal contact information that you're willing to share with us so that we can then send you a gift as a way of saying thank you for joining us today. It is a really cool t-shirt that says the best is yet to come, which I feel like is a perfect tagline for the times we live in right now. Now we're going to move along with our service by worshiping God through our gifts of tithes and offerings. If you are able to give at this point in time, we would love for you to. You can either click on the Give button on your screen, or as always, you can go to the website vineyardwheeling.com give, and you can give. Now we understand that there are many of us right now who are struggling financially, and if you're unable to give, there is no pressure. But for those of us who can, particularly in this time in history, when so many people are in need and so many people can't give, if you can, it's especially important that you do. Let me pray for us as we worship God in this way. Father, thank you so much for the way you take care of us and the way you provide for us. Father, I thank you that all of our needs are known by you. And so, Lord, as we give you back these tithes and offerings, we pray, Father God, that you would use them to help those who, who are in need, to provide for all those who are struggling. And Lord, that you would glorify your name in the midst of all this. Lord, it is in your name we pray. Amen. Let me uh, encourage you also in the fact that we have been partnering with other organizations within the community to help those in need. 
And we can only do that by your faithful giving and your generosity. So thank you. Well, we're moving on with our second installment of Gone Fishing this week. Chris is gonna teach us about how important our own personal story is in fishing as our mission. Enjoy. Well, good morning and welcome to Vineyard Online. So excited that you are here. We're in a series called Gone Fishing. And uh, we started last weekend. We're gonna wrap up next weekend with this series. It's perfect for this time of year. We're gone, going fishing. And uh, the reason we decided to call this series Going Fishing or Gone Fishing is because that is the code language that Jesus used when he called his first disciples. He said, guys, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Come follow me and we're gonna, they were fishermen. We're gonna leave the, the mundane of just going through the motion and working and paying the bills and we're going to bring a bigger mission into your life. We're going after big fish, we're going after people. And uh, we're gonna bring them the greatest message the world has ever heard. We're going to bring them changed lives, life in all of its fullness, eternal life, and we are going to spread the best news the world has ever heard. And that's the calling of Jesus on his followers. Even if you are not one of the original 12 disciples, which I guarantee you aren't, uh, you have been called by God, if you're a follower of Jesus, to go fishing. So every time you leave your house, you're going fishing. Every time you're online, you're going fishing. Everywhere we are, there's this overarching purpose of fishing, and it's the greatest purpose there is. It's the greatest purpose the world has ever known, and it's why Jesus left us behind. You know, his strategy, he told his disciples, the strategy is you guys. And guys, he, he would tell you today, if he were here talking to you instead of me, he would say the strategy is you to help people find life in all of its fullness. Let's go fishing, is what he would say. And you know, without a purpose to live for that's bigger than you, life doesn't make sense either. And this is the purpose that is above all the other purposes. Now, I need to clarify something at this point, uh, because at some point, every metaphor breaks down, right? I mean, they all break down, and, and this is a metaphor, and Jesus didn't intend us to ride this metaphor all the way out and apply everything about fishing to sharing his, his gospel with people. Um, but when we think about fishing, right, we think about putting a, a worm on a hook and then dropping it in the water and tricking a fish into biting what they think is lunch and getting a hook instead and then pulling the fish out of the water and the fish, the fish suffocates because it's not in the water anymore and we eat it. That's not what Jesus had in mind. That's not where this metaphor goes. Jesus in no way, shape or form wants us to, to be the kind of people that use bait and switch, that trick people, that see the people in our lives as projects. He wants us to see people as people, not projects. He doesn't want us to have a checklist of how many we've caught, none of that. He doesn't want us to think about how we can get them to bite. No, no, he wants us to love people. Every one of us wants to be loved and accepted. Every one of us wants to be pursued and valued and, and cared enough about that, that people would share, that the person who cares about us would share what means most to them. And that's what we're talking about here. It's not a, it's not a trick fishing. This is, we're going to go fishing. That means we're on mission. And we're going to go love the world and accept the world pursue people and value them and treat them like people, not projects, and care about them enough to share the hope that we've found. That's what Jesus was talking about. And that's the heart of the Father. And that's what I want to talk about this week is the heart of the Father. Because God loves people. He loves people. And you know, when Jesus was here, he loved people too. And he especially spent extra time with people who weren't church people, which I think is really, really interesting because we're, you know, if you're a church people, then, then you're like, would he spend time with me today? I don't know. I mean, these are great questions to ask, and we're going to dive into that a little bit. 
you know, when we think of church and we think of church people, we think of people who are kind of put together. Their, their lives aren't as jacked up as maybe the general population of the world around us. And that makes a little bit of sense because when you begin to follow Jesus and you apply his teachings to your life, your life gets better and you get better at life. Things start to to click a little bit and things start to go your way because you're making better decisions and you're following the design for life that God set up. And so life gets better and you get better at life. That's, that's part of the deal. But here's the danger in all of that. You can begin to compare yourself to the world around you. And, and what we end up doing is we end up circling up with people who aren't as jacked up as the world around us. And we think, well, I need to protect this. And, and, and so we insulate and we isolate. We become a holy huddle. And ultimately what happens is we become the mission. We, we become the mission instead of the people that Jesus sent us to reach and help find and follow God. And that is a problem. See, when we become the mission, the church begins to die. When you become the mission, you begin to die. That's mission drift. We talked about that last week. And we find ourselves falling into a comparison trap. Everyone else is jacked up by sin. But, you know, well, mine's not as bad. And this is what happened with the religious leaders in Jesus' day, the Pharisees. They weren't sinless. But because they were looking at everybody else's sin, and, it, and, and they weren't as bad as everybody else was, they became blind to their own sin and their own shortcomings. Guys, this is something we have to fight against in our own lives, and it's certainly something we fight against as a church. One of the things we say around here is it's okay to not be okay. We acknowledge the fact that none of us have it all put together, and that, that Jesus will meet us where we are, and he'll walk with us to where he's taking us. He loves us enough to meet us in all of our mess, and then walk with us out of that mess. But this side of heaven, none of us are going to have it all together. None of us are going to be perfect. And Jesus, you know, he demonstrated this when he was here by who he spent time with. He spent time with some of the roughest people <laughs> in their culture. He, he went after the people who were outside the loop of, of the church people, the religious people, and, and, uh, and caused all kinds of grief for himself in the, in the process. But what he showed us is, is that God has a heart for the ragamuffin. God has a heart for the ragamuffin. You know what I mean by ragamuffin? I don't necessarily mean like the most downtrodden, homeless. I mean, it, certainly those folks can be or, or ragamuffins as well, but, but, but just people who don't have it all together. And, um, and, and the ragamuffins are the people who historically just haven't been welcomed in religious circles. You know, many, many years ago, a book came out by a guy named Brennan Manning called The Ragamuffin Gospel. It was a formative book for me, and it's a classic now. I really recommend it if you had, are looking for a book to read, The Ragamuffin Gospel by Brennan Manning. It's excellent. But Brennan writes this in the book. He says, the story goes that a public sinner was excommunicated and forbidden entry to the church. He took his woes to God and he said, they won't let me in, Lord, because I'm a sinner. Well, what are you complaining about, said God? They won't let me in either. And that's exactly what Jesus experienced. The religious leaders in the religious circles would not accept Jesus because he hung out with people who were not in those circles. And yet that's who he came to pursue. So who is a, a ragamuffin? Well, like I said, not the most extreme cases. I mean, certainly the most extreme cases, but this might be somebody at work a friend at school, somebody who feels far from God or doesn't know or have a relationship with God, the, the, the people who aren't the religious put-together people, basically is what we're talking about. You know, uh, Jesus, like I said, hung out with ragamuffins. In Matthew, uh, the book of Matthew, last week we saw Jesus call uh, Simon Peter and Andrew, who were fishermen. They were ragamuffins. They were not put together. They were not the most... Uh, religiously educated people. Uh, they probably, I mean, they were fishermen. They probably had a, some colorful language in their, in their world, and they were just rough around the edges, and Jesus called them to follow him. Then in Matthew chapter 9, which is where we're going to be today, we find Jesus walking through the street, streets of Capernaum. Now, 
he moved to Capernaum, and this was his home base, and he had been teaching there, and people had been listening to what he had to say, and he started gathering a following there. And so when he walks up to Peter and, and, uh, and to Andrew and says, hey, follow me and I'll make you fishers a minute, it says they immediately left their nets and followed him. It wasn't like he was using Jedi mind tricks. They knew who he was. They were familiar with him, and they had made up their mind that uh, they thought he was the real deal, and they immediately left their nets and followed him. And the same thing is the case today. In Matthew 9, we find Jesus walking through town, and he comes upon a guy named Matthew or Levi. And uh, he's a tax collector. Now, what you need to understand about tax collectors in their culture, where they had, they had a hierarchy of people, and the tax collectors were the most uh, the most grievous ragamuffins. They were the people who were farthest from God. They had religious leaders up here, religious people here, then they had regular old people, and then they had sinners. And then under sinners, they had tax collectors. And the tax collectors had, had betrayed their country and ripped people off for, for extra money, and they were hated and they were shunned. Nobody would even talk to tax collectors. And so if you have a Bible, you can open up to Matthew chapter 9. And Jesus is walking through the streets of Capernaum. And it says in verse 9, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Guys, this is absolutely scandalous. You don't talk to tax collectors, let alone as a religious leader, invite them in to the inner circle. And that's exactly what Jesus does. It says, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with them and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Matthew gathers his tax collector and sinners, sinner friends, all the ragamuffins, and they have dinner with Jesus. This is come and see evangelism, right? Come and see fishing. Look at, look at what, get, spend some time with Jesus and get to know him. And, and you know what? You're going to end up falling in love with Jesus. And so Matthew does this and Jesus is there and the religious leaders are looking on and going, you, you shouldn't even be talking to these people, let alone eating with them. And so they ask, why is, why is he doing that? And Jesus answers back, look, it's the sick who need a doctor, not the well. I have come. I have come for them. And Jesus, over and over and over again, makes this point. And it's not about the holy huddle. It's not about the people who have it all together. It's about the ragamuffins, the people who are far from God. And his plan was to put together an army of ragamuffins, army, an army of ragamuffin fishermen. <laughs> and, the, and here's the problem, folks. If you've been following Jesus for any length of time, you begin to believe your own press. You begin to believe you got it together. You begin to prepare. And, you, and, and, and over time, what I've seen happen so much is we forget that, in fact, we are ragamuffins this side of heaven we're always going to be a ragamuffin. And the moment you forget you're a ragamuffin is the moment you become dangerous. You become dangerous to yourself. You become dangerous for the people around you who are far from God. And, and uh, just remember, you are a sinner in need of God's grace and his mercy. Don't ever forget that. You know, many years ago now, I went to a vineyard conference, and uh, one of the speakers at the conference was Todd Hunter. Todd was the guy who planted our church here in Wheeling, West Virginia in 1979. And, he sp and as he spoke, he said something that absolutely rocked my world. It, it was something I knew that was true in my heart. I just didn't, hadn't heard it put this way before. And this is what he said. He said, <laughs> the church is the only organization on earth that exists primarily for those who aren't here yet. Let me say that again. The church is the only organization on earth that exists primarily for those who aren't here yet. We so often, because of the dynamics I've already explained, tend to, be, to begin to believe that church is about us. And yet Jesus 
pursued, spent time with, loved, called into ministry the messy people, the ragamuffins. Again, it's why we we say it's okay to not be okay. It's why we extend grace for people no matter where you've been or what you've done, no matter how many mistakes you've made in this life. There is a place at the table for you here in God's family, here at the Vineyard Church for sure. This is a place for people in process. It's okay to not be okay. It's so important. And it's so important that we remember who Jesus spent most of his time with. Now, there's another tax collector that Jesus spent some time with, a guy named Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus lived in the town of Jericho. One day Jesus walks into Jericho. There's almost a parade of people around him, huge crowds. Everybody wants to be near Jesus at this point. And he walks into town and he stops and he calls Zacchaeus out of the crowd, calls him by name, says, Zacchaeus, come here. Now, Zacchaeus isn't just a regular tax collector. He's the chief tax collector. He is hated by everyone, ignored and shunned by everyone. Jesus calls him out of the crowd and says, I'm going to go have lunch at your house today, which would have been a phenomenal honor for Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus takes Jesus home. They have lunch. Zacchaeus has what's, you know, equivalent of a come to Jesus meeting. He, he, he realizes that his life has been completely off track, that he has made a lot of mistakes. And he says, you know what, Jesus, I'm going to make it right. I'm going to pay people back. I'm changing the way I'm living. Jesus looks at him and says, wow, salvation has come to this house today. And again, the religious leaders are right there. The self-righteous are right there going, what's he doing hanging out with a, with a tax collector? And Jesus turns to them and in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, and, uh, and he says this, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. My purpose is for people who are spiritually lost. I, I came because they weren't getting the message. They didn't realize that God loved them, that there was a place at the table for them, that there was hope and life and blessing and eternal life for them. I've come to find people who are lost spiritually. Guys, this is the mission. This is the purpose. This is the very heart of the Father. You know, Brennan Manning in the Ragamuffin Gospel also said this. He said, the sinners to whom Jesus directed his messianic ministry, were not those who skipped morning devotions or Sunday church. His ministry was to those whom society considered real sinners. They had done nothing to merit salvation, yet they opened themselves to the gift that was offered them. On the other hand, the self-righteous placed their trust in the works of the law and closed their hearts to the message of grace. Boy, that can happen so subtly, so subtly. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells uh, the story of of, uh, the lost coin and the lost sheep and how the the shepherd would leave the 99 to go after the one who was far off. And he, he tells the story of the prodigal son and how the father waited and waited and waited for that son who was lost to come home. He never gave up on him. And when he came home, He threw a party for him and he put a robe on his back and a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And he killed the fattened calf and had everybody come together and threw a party. And he said, that's what God does when somebody who's far off, somebody who feels like they've gone so far that they could never, never come home to God, comes home. God's longing and waiting for people to come over. He has amazing grace and reckless love for us. For I spoke a word you were singing over me You have been so, so good to me For I took a breath you breathed your life in me have been so, so kind to me. No, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless 
this love of God Oh, it chases me down Fights till I'm found Leaves a 99 I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away been so, so good to me. Yes, you have. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. Deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. But, you know, I have a sense that there are some of us watching this today, and, and you can just totally relate to Zacchaeus. You can relate to the, to the, the younger brother and the prodigal son who, who went away and blew, blew it, and you feel like your life is a mess. 
And you're asking the question, I mean, did Jesus really come for me? I mean, could he really love me? Could he really, really give me a relationship with God and fill the empty place in my heart and turn my life around? And the answer is absolutely yes. It's why he came. He came for you. If you were the only person on earth, his reckless love would have driven him here to rescue you. And, and, and all he asks is that you turn around and come home. That you, you, you come to God and you say, I believe. You know, Jesus said, if, if, you know, I've come, I've loved the world, I've come to save the world. So that if you just believe in me, if you place your faith in me, you won't perish, but you'll have everlasting life. And he invites you to that everlasting life right now, today. And it's really just a matter of coming to him and saying, I believe I place my faith in you. If you've never done that before, I want to invite you to do that right now. Just close your eyes where you are and say something along these lines. Say, say God, I believe you sent Jesus and he's your son. I believe he died in my place to pay the penalty for my wrongdoings and I need that forgiveness now. God, come into my life. Teach me how to follow you. Change my life from this day forward. In your name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, if you just prayed with me, congratulations. This is the best day of your life and the best decision you could have ever made. I am so excited for you. And you've got quite a journey ahead. And I want to be able to help you with that. And so if you would let me know that you prayed with me just then, you can type or text the word follow to 304-242-0463 um, and, and let me know. Just text the word follow to 304-242-0463 and we will get back to you with some resources that will help you get started in that relationship with Jesus. Now, here's what I know at this point in time. There are some longtime Christians who are, are, are watching this today and going, yeah, but what about me? What about me? And I can relate because I am a longtime Christian. I grew up in church. I mean, from the time I was born, I was on the front pew at church. And at the end of the day, we, we really do want things to be all about us. And there's this human nature. Um, and if God is obsessed with people who are far from him and we're supposed to join him on that mission, what about us? And I want to take you to the end of Luke 15, where the prodigal son comes home. The party is going on. His older brother, who was, was there the whole time, who followed the rules, who, who did what his father asked him to do, gets a little bent out of shape because his brother just blew, blew half the family fortune, made every mistake in the book, and now they're throwing a party for him. And he's outside and he's upset. And the father comes out to him. Let's turn to, to Luke 15, verse, verse 31. And it says this. The father says this to his, his older son. My son, the father said, you're always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. I love this. He very gently reprimands the older brother or the longtime believer. Don't make this about you. Your brother was gone. We thought he was dead. We thought he was going. To, we were never going to see him again. And he's come home. We have to celebrate. And you, you are always with me. I mean, we're always together. We enjoy fellowship and celebrations and and everything I have is yours and that's what God says to us longtime Christians God, you, I'm with you and you're with me all the time you get to enjoy worship and fellowship and a relationship with God and we get to learn and grow and life gets better and we get better at life and we live a life that is blessed because we know God and those are all the benefits. That's, that's, that's worth it all right there. But don't confuse the benefits with the mission. Never confuse the mission with the benefits. 
As longtime believers, we get to enjoy a relationship with God and everything that that entails, and with one another. We get to live on the estate. But the heart of God beats for his sons and daughters who are far off because he's missing that relationship with them. Does he love the church people? Oh yeah, he loves us so much. His reckless love <laughs> extends to us. He just doesn't love it when we get self-righteous and self-absorbed. And he's called us to join him in fishing. It's your mission. Fishing is the mission. It's your calling. It is the heart of the Father. You know, when you think about it, God calls us to go on a fishing trip with him, a fishing trip with Dad. And there are a few things that are better than that. Well, as we go through this series, we're, we're looking at, at different ways to go fishing. I want to give you practical tools that you can hang on to and, and apply. And last week we talked about come and see fishing and just inviting people to come and see, uh, come and see, spend some time with, with you, spend some time, you know, hey, why don't you come to church with me? Why don't you go to a concert with me? Why don't you come hang out with me and my, my friends who happen to be Christians and get to know Jesus that way? And it's the easiest form of fishing. It's something that we can do and should be doing every day, right? But this week, what I want to, the, the, the type of fishing that I would like to, to teach you about is sharing your story. And the good news about sharing your story is you can't mess this up. It's your story, right? You can't mess up your story other than to not prepare to tell your story. We are to be prepared to tell our story. And for very good reasons. In 1 Peter, <coughs> excuse me, in 1 Peter 3, verse 15, it says this, in your hearts, rever revere Christ as Lord. In your hearts, remember that Jesus is in charge and remember that he has told you to go fishing, to go help people find and follow God. This is your highest purpose. And then he says this, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. He wants us to be ready to give an answer for the hope that we found. Basically, what he's saying is, you know, spend time with people, let people get to know you. And as they get to know you and see Jesus in your life, they're going to ask you questions about why, why are you different? Why, why do you not participate in the gossip at the water cooler? Why are you honest even when it costs you? Why do you not tear down your spouse like everybody else does? Why, why, why? And they'll see something different in you. And when they do and they ask you what's different about you, you have to be prepared and be prepared to tell your story. Now, the good news about your story is it's your story. People can't argue with it. They can't deny it. And typically, people are genuinely interested in your story as long as you're not pushy and rude about it. That's why he says do this with gentleness and respect. So very important. So how do you tell your story? Well, I'm going to give you some pointers here. And I'm going to ask you, I'm actually going to give you some homework this week. I'm going to ask you to spend a little time preparing your story. And I want you to prepare two versions. Prepare a 60 second version and prepare a three minute version. And what this is, uh, what this is going to include is, is sitting down and writing it out and then practicing it. And the outline is super simple, three part outline. The first part is what was your life like before Jesus? This might be, I was a drug addict, I was in jail, maybe it wasn't that dramatic, maybe I was really successful, but there was, there was this emptiness in my soul. I knew there had to be something more. Maybe it was I was going through life and life was okay, but, but I realized that I needed something bigger to live for. Whatever it is, whatever your story is before Jesus, share that part. And then part two is how you met Jesus. My brother invited me to church. My boss shared his story with me. I had this event happen in my life and it opened my eyes. Whatever it is, share that part. And then share part three, how life is different now. How's your life different? What difference has it made? The, the empty is gone. I, I, I have peace 
in my soul. I'm not a drug addict anymore. I'm not in jail anymore. Whatever it is. And it might be dramatic and it might be, might be just really normal. But uh, whatever it is, it's your story. And God will use your story if you're prepared to tell it. Now, here's, here's what I know about some people who are longtime church people. Because this is, this is my situation. What if you don't have a before story? Like, I grew up on the front pew. Uh, I gave my life to Jesus when I was five and was baptized. I don't remember a life before Jesus. But you know what? I still have a story. And so do you, if you're in that situation. You still have the Holy Spirit living in you. You still have a life that is different, a heart that is full, and a relationship with God. You have a story to tell. So don't, don't let yourself off the hook because I don't have a before story. Just spend some time preparing to tell your story. Think it out. Write it down, a one-minute version and a three-minute version, and then practice telling it a few times. And then find a family member or a friend that you can practice telling it to once or twice. And then what I want to invite you to do is I want to invite you to video it. Just a selfie with your phone, selfie video with your phone, and put it on social media and tag Vineyard Wheeling. We'll put some instructions on how to do that in the chat. And we'll have some links that you can go to to get instructions on, to do, on how to do that. It's not difficult to do. But here's the deal. Your story may be the most powerful tool you have in your fishing arsenal. And, uh, and if every one of us were to share our story, just a one-minute version of our story, and put it on social media with all the people in our church, we are connected via social media to every person in the Ohio Valley. Can you imagine how many people we will reach with our stories? And guys, I've watched stories open people's hearts to Jesus time after time after time. Let's reach our whole community in the next week as we practice our stories and then share them and put them online. Next week, we're going to wrap up with Gone Fishing. It's going to be a great message, and you want to be here for that. God, thank you so much that you've created us to live for a purpose that's bigger than us. Thank you that you came after us to rescue us, to save us, to give us life in all of its fullness. And Lord, it wasn't just for the people who were put together, but it was for the ragamuffins. God, thanks for, for loving us right where we are. And Lord, thanks for walking with us as we walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, folks. My name is Mike, and some of you might recognize me as one of the pastors here at the Vineyard. I'm going to give you an example of the one-minute story that Chris is talking about by sharing my story. I went to church most of my life growing up. I knew who God and Jesus were intellectually, but I didn't really know them. I played football in high school and our team won a couple of state championships, which is a pretty big deal in this area. I was the president of my fraternity in college and after college, I was an officer in the US Navy. And after that, I had a pretty good job. It seemed like everything was going great in life until it wasn't. Around 15 years ago, when I was in my mid thirties, seemingly out of nowhere, my life started crumbling. Within a couple of years, my marriage at the time became a disaster. My daughter, who was a toddler, was in and out of the hospital with pretty serious asthma, and I switched career paths and in a place where I was working went out of business. I could go on, but to keep it short, I'll just say my life very quickly and unexpectedly became a hot mess. In 2006, I started coming to the vineyard, and that's where I met Jesus. I learned who Jesus is and learned that my real issue wasn't what was going wrong in my life. It was that I didn't have Jesus filling what was missing in my life to walk with me when things do go wrong, because inevitably we're all going to face trials and struggles. I asked Jesus to be my Savior and Lord, and over the next few years, I started the adventure that walking with him leads to. Everything, and I mean everything, has changed since then. If someone would have told me 15 years ago that I'd be a pastor working for a church, I would have laughed at them, but that's where I am. More importantly, Jesus brought real meaning and hope to my life. And I now know that regardless of the trials and struggles that I face in life, I'm never walking through anything alone. 
And God wants that kind of meaning, purpose, peace, and hope for all of us. So if you feel like something's missing in your life, I want to invite you to come and see who Jesus is and see why he's the only one who can provide what's mis- provide for what's missing in your life. I love hearing stories of faith, and I'm so excited that I'm going to get to see, hopefully, many stories posted on social media in the coming weeks. So let's do what Chris said. Let's think about our stories, write them down, practice them, then record them and post them so that our friends and our family can can know the backstory of our faith. And hopefully, through hearing multiple stories, they'll be closer to coming to Christ. Want to make sure also that you know you need to fill out that connection card. We want to see that name come through on our screen. And also, if you need prayer for anything, you can click on the prayer button right now to pray with someone right now, or you can add that prayer request to your connection card. Hey, listen, have a great week fishing. We'll see you next week.